neighborhood was a place where at times that you felt worried, scared, unsafe, would take care of you. He had a singular vision of kindness and love. Love is at the root of everything. All learning, all relationships, love or the lack of it. The greatest thing that we can do is to help somebody know that they're loved and capable of loving. Won't you please, won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor? Man, I love Mr. Rogers, don't you? <clears throat> I love that. Hey, uh, what a privilege it is for Denise and me to be with you this weekend, uh, today especially. Uh, and man, I tell you, the, the music here is just an inspiration to me. I, I just, I just want to sit there all day and just listen to them. I mean, the, the drums, where are your drums? I mean, you, you, you nailed it. And, uh, and bass and, and guitar, man, that last song, incredible. Keyboard, uh, sax, oh my gosh, you just brought me to Jesus. I mean, that, that sax is just... And, and the two sisters up here singing, I can't, I can't figure out which one is the older sister and which is the younger sister, but, but I know, I know, I know, I know, just go work with me here, all right? <laughs> but, but uh, oh my gosh, what a, and Brandon, Brandon, we love you, and, um, and my gosh, what a gifted group of uh, musicians here, what a privilege it is for, for Denise and me to be part of this. Um, and, and I got to say a little bit about your pastor, um, Chap Clark has uh, become a dear friend of mine. And, um, you know, it was a, a number of years ago, I was uh, serving, we were serving in San Antonio, Texas. And, and I, 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 was, I was responsible for all the chaplains in, in what we call Air Education and Training Command, which means we get all the young people uh, into our, our chapels and into our, uh, under our, our care. And uh, we're just pounding our head on the wall trying to figure out how, how, do, you, how do you reach young people? How, how do you do it? And so I'm, I'm doing some searching and, and, you know, I'm Googling like everybody else does, right? And I run across a book called Hurt 2.0. And I go, whoa, this, wh whoever wrote this knows what they're talking about. He's speaking to me, speaking to our chaplains. And, 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 uh, and so I, on a whim, I, I hunt them down and I go, hey, chap, uh, you don't know me from Adam and you have no reason to know me. But, that, but the fact is, is that I need some help. And, and he came out to San Antonio and did a seminar for us. And, uh, and within a day and a half, he had retooled our chaplain corps in a way that, uh, that literally made a difference in the way we're reaching airmen, young families, <clears throat> and, uh, and the people that we're chartered to, to care for and pastor. And, uh, and, and then fast forward another couple of years, we had him last year come out to Washington, D.C., which is where I'm at now. And we, have, we had our, our annual, what we call chaplain corps summit. And, and Chap came out, he's one of the featured speakers, and oh my gosh, he just, just nailed it. He is still, to this day, a year later, almost a year later, the people, or one of the people he, uh, that most gets talked about and most gets remembered. And the notes that people took uh, are, are still surfacing and saying this is, this is what right looks like. And so uh, I, hope you, I hope you have just a, a tingling, uh, uh, just a tiny, tiny um, bit, bit of, of a... Of a uh, a bump up in your appreciation for your pastor because this guy rocks. This guy rocks. <laughs> you know, one of the things that um, I remember as a child growing up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, little, little town, about 50,000 people, pretty, uh, pretty uh, agrarian type, industrial type, factory workers and, and so forth. And, and we... Uh, um, it was just a great place to, to grow up, and besides that, a lot of there's airplanes everywhere, since we were like the home, the mecca of general aviation, and, and I tell you, I, I couldn't have picked a better place to, to grow up, but in the family I grew up in, um, family of six, I was the oldest of four, and the oldest of four kids, and, and uh, you know, tiny little house, and one bathroom, and I'll let you picture what that might look like, six people, one house, little bathroom, and uh, anyway, um, it was amazing, but one of the things that was true about my family is that you went to church. Church 
was Sunday and Sunday was church. And you just, you never separated those two. And, and you know, in fact, my brothers and I, even though we thought about once in a while, we never, never even decided to challenge it because we knew we wouldn't get anywhere. But the fact is, is that we went to church and we also went to Sunday school. And, and as a kid at, uh, at Emmanuel United Church of Christ at 1306 Michigan Street, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, you, you went down into the basement. You went down in this uh, cold, damp basement. That's where the kids hung out. And, and we would see these little slides and flannel graphs and, and all this kind of stuff that we always got taught about the parables of Jesus. Now, we heard a little bit about Moses, a little bit about Abraham, a little Old Testament thrown in once in a while, but the, but the parables Tell you what, parables were, were it, and, uh, and that's where we got most of our teaching. And I remember like it was yesterday, and, and it was a long time ago, actually, but I remember like it was yesterday, my teacher's telling me over and over and over again, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Isn't that sweet? You know, and, and I, I kind of hung on to that, and that worked for me. I, I, I rode that horse for, for a whole bunch of, a bunch of years. And, uh, and it wasn't until just a few years ago when I did a little bit more thinking and reading about the parables where I began to believe that my teachers, bless their hearts, uh, cut, cut short the impact of parables on the church. You see, a good parable, and all of Jesus' parables are good, by the way, but, and, but, but a good parable, the, all of the teachings of Jesus are, are such that they kind of draw you in, a nice story. It's a, nice, it's a little bit of a Mr. Rogers moment. You just kind of get drawn in, and then, and then you kind of get drawn in a little further, and right about the time you think you're safe, Something, something happens, and, and your whole world gets thrown upside down. You go, oh, my gosh. And especially, especially if you're one of the religious folk, if, you're, if, you're, if you think you kind of got this God thing figured out, you're, you're kind of grooving with Jesus and the, and, the, and, the, and the faith thing of part of your life, you think you got pretty well squared away, if you read the parables with the intent in which they were written, I guarantee you, it's going to mess with you. It's going to mess with you. And it's not always going to be fun. It's a little bit like the story about a depressed frog, okay? A dog, in, or excuse me, a, a depressed frog. This frog is going through a, a state of depression. Okay, go, work with me here, okay? So this, uh, this frog's having a bad day. And, and he, this depressed frog decides to go to a fortune teller. And, and he goes to the fortune teller and says, you know, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm just really... I'm really in a bad place. You know, get me some good news. Give me some good news. And, and so, so the, the fortune teller closes her eyes and starts making some really strange noises. And, and, then, and then finally out of her mouth comes these words. You will soon meet a beautiful young girl that will want to know everything about you. And the frog goes, yes, yes, this is exactly the news I was hoping for. This is exactly what I was hoping for. What? And he tells the fortune, he asks the fortune, when will I meet her? When, how will I meet her? Will it be like a party or something? How will I meet her? And the fortune teller says, you will meet her in her biology class. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. If you don't get it, ask somebody later on, okay? <laughs> you know, I love the parables of Jesus because they jump at us a little bit like this poor frog. But I invite you at this time, if you're so inclined, to stand with me as I read our scripture for this morning. Coming from Luke chapter 11, beginning with verse 5. I'll read, read through verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus, Jesus says to them, suppose, just, just suppose, work with me here, it says Jesus, just suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, hey friend, lend me three loaves of bread. 
a friend of mine on a journey has, has just come to be with me and I have no food to offer him. And Jesus continues and says, and, and suppose the one on the inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't give up anything. I can't give you anything right now. I tell you, says Jesus, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because he's a friend, he will get up because of your shameless audacity. He will surely get, get up and give you everything you need. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. I love, I love your mission statement. A neighborhood church with a global impact. I love that. That is inspired. It really is. And I'm excited for you and for the way that, that you all are moving this church uh, and, and, and being a, a leader in the kingdom making business of, of, of this part of the world and, and quite frankly the entire world. And, and yet when a, when a neighborhood church really asks itself, what is it, what is it uh, that ought to be characteristic of us? What, what is it that, that we ought to be known for? What are some of the things that, that we need to kind of think about in order to be more fully in line with God's vision of the church? We have to ask ourselves, what, what about the DNA of the church? Uh, is, 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 it, it needs to be in line with the DNA of God. What is it that that alignment looks like? And, and I'm here to tell you, that every inspired word of scripture helps us answer that question, including this morning's text. So how does a neighborhood church learn to reflect more purely the heart of God? And as we kind of look at this, at this pericope, of, as, we, as we look at this passage, this, this parable, I, I'm, I just want to offer a couple things that kind of jumped out at me. A couple things that help me uh, kind of figure out how do, we, how do we glue together the DNA of God and the DNA of a neighborhood church. And it starts first and foremost with this idea that the neighborhood church needs to be okay with a little disruption. So when Jesus asks his, his, his followers when Jesus, when Jesus is, is teaching this, this group of ragtag people who just really love learning from Jesus, when he tells the story, when he says, you know, a guy has a visitor in the middle of the night, and, and, and just like that, without even thinking, the guy says, oh my gosh, I have nothing to feed my visitor. And so he goes to the neighbor, and he goes to the neighbor, and he, he hollers, George, George. And I don't know if his name is George, but let's go, for, let's, let's play with it here, okay? But the George, George, and, and he, he wakes George up. And, and if George is anything like me, he probably would have pulled the covers over a little tighter and pretended not to hear him, right? Because maybe he'll just go away. And so, so George is inside, and, and he's hearing his friend holler his name, and, 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 and he's trying to ignore, and he's trying to ignore, and finally, finally he gets up and says, ah, what do you want? And the neighbor says, got an unexpected visitor. I need some, I need something to feed him. I need some bread. And, uh, and the guy says, you know, my kids are sleeping. The door's already locked. Come on, dude. This is like, this is like, this is a really a bad, bad timing on your part. And, and when Jesus tells the story, he literally asks his audience, how many of you think the guy would have came up with lame excuses like his kids are sleeping and the doors are locked. And the answer in Middle Eastern thinking is nobody, no one, absolutely no one would have come up with lame excuses. Why? Because this isn't an individual issue. This is a community issue. You see, the reputation of the person who now has a visitor is not the primary concern of Jesus' story. 
It's the reputation of the community at large. And this comes to light very, very clearly when you take apart one of the key Greek words in this, in this pericope, the, 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 the word anadia. And it, it, it literally means um, to, to, to preserve one's honor. And it, it has to do not just with a particular person's honor, but with a community honor. It literally means to protect from being shamed. And, and, and it's, it's the avoidance of shame is at the root of this word. And, and when you think in terms of, 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 the, of, of, of Jesus teaching this story, helping us and 2,000s of people, 2,000 years of church before us, understand the DNA of the church. We understand, you know, it's not about us. Even though we like to look good, we like to drive nice cars, we like to live in nice homes, we like to give off good impressions. The fact is, is that, is that what Jesus is most concerned about is the reputation, the protection from shame of the community of God, of the church of Jesus Christ. You see, this is a community effort. It comes out so very clearly in, in this story. The perception of Jesus the perception Jesus gives of the community is paramount because it's all about protecting and allowing the, 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 the church of Jesus Christ to have a solid and, and affirming reputation everywhere it's found. You see radical hospitality and, and the radical hospitality of the neighborhood church knows this, that disruptions merely give us an opportunity to demonstrate our true character. And it's a community character that's at stake here. Not just individuals, but a community character. And so as we talk about disruption, I also want to say a word about diligence. There's a certain kind of diligence that's going on in this story as well. So the guy comes and middle of the night, knocks on George's door. Actually, he doesn't knock. He calls his name because strangers would have knocked. Friends, call your name. The name is sounded. There's a little bit of disruption maybe, and, and, and yet we see in Jesus' story that the man gets up and gets his friend anything and everything he needs. He asked for three loaves of bread, but you know, friends, it would be an absolute insult to offer a visitor only bread. It would be an absolute insult. There is, there is no way around it. If you understand Middle Eastern uh, history, there, a, a loaf of bread in and of itself is not a meal. Bread is the knife, fork, and spoon for your meal. And so when this, when this neighbor comes to, an, to his friend's house and says, I need three loaves of bread, what he's really saying is, I need the bread that you have, and I also need that stew and, and the vegetables and the salad and, and the other things that, that I'm, I, I know you have because I want to honor my visitor, because I want him to leave this place knowing that it wasn't just me that took care of him, it was his community that took care of him. And so... Not only, and this is, this is bore out as we, as, we, as we read deeper into this passage, there, there's, a, there's a level of extravagance going on here. There's a level of diligence that is just, just not maybe at the surface, but the fact is, is it wasn't just bread that was offered. It was an entire meal. In 1995, I, I made my first trip into Iraq. I was a, the chaplain for a special ops group that was a special operations group that was, that was going into Kurdish villages in, in northern Iraq and, and trying to discern some of their needs and some of the, some of the concerns that were going on in, uh, in, in the villages. They were under constant attack from, from Saddam Hussein. In fact, we actually walked through some of the decimated villages. I can still see it today. Villages that might have been around for thousands of years where Kurdish villages uh, existed. And Saddam Hussein and his army decimated these. And then he, he, he would move them into these kind of concentration camp types and, and places and said that they would be much more uh, cared for in this place. Not true, but the fact is, is that they were left alone for the most part. And we went to visit them to see how they were doing. 
So we take two Black Hawk helicopters, and, and uh, there's about six or seven of us and about, about 15 defenders uh, provide security. We land helicopters outside the uh, outskirts of town. Security detail would go out, and we would walk into the city. And within a few minutes, and it just magically happened every time we went, within a few minutes, and I'm, and I'm traveling, I'm the chaplain for, you know, a couple Navy SEALs, a couple, uh, a couple co um, Rangers, and uh, some uh, combat controllers from the Air Force. We had a coalition for it, which means we had a couple Brits and, and, a, and a Frenchman or two, and, and the fact is we're, we're, uh, we're in the middle of the city within minutes, and we're sitting in the dirt in a semicircle, and, and there's seven or eight of us, and, and then all of a sudden there's seven, eight of them, and the village leaders of this Kurdish village uh, come together, and we're talking now through an interpreter. And the interest that we're most concerned about is, is births and deaths and, and, and medical concerns and, and fresh water and, and, you know, so basically how are you doing? And the, and the data that we collected would go back up to USAID and other humanitarian organizations so that they could fine-tune the humanitarian aid that was going uh, to these Kurdish villages that were, quite frankly, um, all on their own. And uh, we would be together for about an hour sitting in the circle. And, um, and, and it was uh, just amazing being a part of this conversation and hearing the interpreter explain what their concerns were and, and, and how much they appreciate our being there. And, and then at the end, when it was all over, we shook hands and, 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 and did our, our, our farewells, our respectful moments. And, and then they, they said, follow us. And the first time this happened to me, I kind of freaked out. I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa where are we going now? And, and, but it's the Kurdish leaders that said, follow us. And they, they took us over to another part of their little village. And now we've only been on the ground for maybe an hour and 15 minutes. I kid you not. And, and we get ushered into this place where there is a buffet set up that, that would rival the finest hotel in Southern California. I kid you not. There was there there were there were there was meat prepared. There was salads. There there was vegetables. There was bread everywhere. Fresh bread, not old stuff that they dug out of some closet. But no, this is hot bread. And 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 there's stuff I had no idea what it was. And and I tried to you know minimize that. But but the fact is is that within an hour or so, we had they had prepared a buffet for us, not because we said we were hungry. Not because one of them heard our stomachs grumble. Not because, you know, they, 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 they thought it was lunchtime. It was because the respect of the community was dependent upon the lasting impression we had on them. And, or they had on us. And I'm here to tell you, I'm still talking about this 25 years later. I mean, I was blown away. And this just didn't happen once. Every time I went on one of these trips, it was essentially a rerun of the... And, and the radical hospitality that was shown by Kurdish people to a bunch of ragtag GIs, I tell you what, I wanted, I wanted to become a Kurd after that, you know? I mean, I was looking, so do you have like an application form for how to become Kurdish? You know, Because I, I want one of those. I, I, I'm just, I, I was so blown away with the hospitality that they showed. You see, radical hospitality, the neighborhood church with radical hospitality will win over even the most hardened critics of the church. So we talk about disruption, a little bit about diligence, and finally I just want to say a word about daring. You know, we Presbyterians aren't really good with this daring thing, are we? Taking risks. You know, we don't have the book of risk. We have the book of order, right? You know, and, and you know, we, 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 don't, we, don't do, we don't do crazy, right? Um, but, but the fact is, we got a crazy savior. I mean, really, look at it. I mean, who in their right mind leaves the, 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 the perfect, beautiful, heavenly world and, 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 and exchanges all that for a body that has aches and pains like ours do? Who does that? And, and who, who leaves the, the throne of God so that you can exchange that for essentially a life of homelessness? I mean, who, who does that? And, and thirdly, 
you know, who willingly and on their own volition says, yes, yes, I, I will die the most excruciating death you can find. I will suffer, I will die, I will, I will do whatever it takes so that my mostly ungrateful followers will never, ever have to answer for their sin. I mean, who does that? If that's not crazy, I don't know what is. And, and the fact is, is that, is that we need to think about Jesus a little, a little daringly sometimes, a little crazy. And, and I, I, when I think about crazy, I think about a church that Denise and I used to attend down in, in, in uh, Hampton, Virginia, when we were stationed down in, in Southern Virginia. A church called Water's Edge Church, a guy, Pastor Stu Hodges, he had spiked hair, you know, and he'd run around crazy, and, you know, this guy's nuts. But, but he was growing a church that was just incredible. He, he gave a sermon once. Now, now just stay with me here. He, he had a balance beam on the, on the stage, literally. It was like four inches off. It was, you know, regular. He probably stole it from some high school. But he did, he did his entire sermon do, doing this. So, you know, life is, life, life is hard. And, and a lot of times you, 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 you don't feel real stable. And he, he did an entire 30-minute sermon on that thing. You know, he fell off a couple times. That was part of his point. Got back up and, and proceeded. I mean, who does that? He's crazy. But here's the kicker. We're, we go on one Sunday night, and, and, he's, uh, and we walk in. Denise and I walk in to the, to the opening area of the church, and, uh, and, and we get blown away, blown away by the smell of warm chocolate chip cookies. Those rascals are bacon chocolate chip cookies in, in the gathering. They got these little mini ovens, and they are, they are making chocolate. And, and, and every kid running around had a gooey face and, and had chocolate all over their hands, and, and, and moms were reaching for napkins. What they really wanted was a piece of the cookie. And, 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 and I mean, there was, a, there was an impression of church burned into the souls of those kids that night. And I promise you, never went away. Talk about crazy. Talk about, talk about daring. You know, and, and, and so here's the fun part. Is we get to have fun doing this. We get to have fun creating the impressions that, you know, that church you used to go to, that church of old, that, that, that experience, there was, there was, it was fine, it was good, but you know what? This is, a, this is a new day, and we serve a living Savior, and he's pretty exciting. So there you have it. Jesus challenges his followers. He challenges the status quo once again. He says, plan on some disruption and plan on being inconvenienced. Be careful, my friends, when you make comfort your goal. And if you're really interested in following me, says Jesus, expect some disruption. Because those moments when you're disrupted, those moments when you kind of get caught by surprise, that's when the true character, not just of the Christian come out, but the true, Christ, the true character of the church of Jesus Christ. And church, um, you know, what if? What if this neighborhood church began to have a reputation? I'm sure it already does, but even more so outside there of, uh, wow, you know, I visited there once and I was blown away. It was amazing. People came up to me and they talked to me. They wanted to know my story. They, wanted to care, they cared about me. I felt like I was at home and, and there was some great feelings that I left with. And we Presbyterians, we probably do need to take a few more risks. We need to do crazy things once in a while, all in a way of, of building the community and, quite frankly, the reputation of the church of Jesus Christ. I can almost smell those chocolate chip cookies. So some of you are saying, you know what, I, 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 you don't know me. I'm, I, I, just, I got a tough life. You know, I'm, I am inundated with kind of my own stuff. I've got family members to take care of. I, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm not sure I have much more to give. And... I'm here to tell you that, that, that giving to others, that diligently and daringly 
giving into others is, is, is one of the most incredible uh, ways of, of getting past our own sense of, of hurt and difficulty. Resilience experts have proven that, that, that service to others, especially those that have nothing to give in return, giving to another is one of the greatest and surest ways to raise your own sense of resilience and, and able to, your ability to, to bounce through and back from difficulties. My friends, it's pretty exciting. The gospel of Jesus Christ is alive and well. And Jesus' story is every bit as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Can you smell those cookies yet? Let's pray.